For those who haven't been in any of my sessions or conversations thus far, very briefly, I'm Stephen Sacker. My day job is at the BBC, working uh, on a show called Hard Talk, an interview program, which means that I get the privilege of coming to St. Gallen and conducting some interviews. Uh, and I do mean privilege because the guests that I meet and the conversations I have here are invariably interesting. Interesting is a bit of a lame word. They're usually compelling and fascinating, and I think this one is going to be. Uh, by way of a very brief introduction to my guest today, um, some of you will know him, many of you may not, but his story is absolutely crucial to an understanding of Japan today, and actually even beyond that, an understanding of, of global economic strategy and how global capitalism works, because it exposes cultural and economic differences between very important pillars of the world economy, and I think we'll unpick some of that over the next 45 minutes. Michael Woodford is his name. He rose through decades of loyal service to the Olympus company, headquartered in Japan, to become the boss, the ultimate boss, appointed in 2011 to the position of president. And that was a rare accolade. I'm sure many of you who know Japan know that it is very, very rare indeed for a foreigner, an outsider, to the rise to the very top of a major Japanese corporation. But that really was just the beginning of the story that we're going to hear about today, Michael, because, uh, well, let's say within days or weeks of getting that top job as president of the company, it was no longer going the way that you thought it would. I think the best thing to do by way of starting this conversation yeah. is um, have you explain the attitude you brought to that moment when you were invited to take the top job, and we'll take it from there. We've also got a vote to, yeah. to conduct, but I want to hear the first answer, and then we'll get into the first vote. What I brought to the job, mm. are you asking? Yeah. Um, I had run businesses for Olympus in America and for the eight years before becoming president uh, in Europe, which constitutes around 40% of Olympus's total core product turnover. And I suppose I demonstrated that while the company is known as a consumer electronics business, cameras, its, its principal business is healthcare. It's, it's the, the world leader in endoscopy, has 70% market share. And by managing that business in the right way, I demonstrated how profitable it was. And uh, that's why I was asked to take the position of president in Japan. How daunted were you by that idea of taking over one of Japanese, Japan's iconic companies and a company that, like so many others, was extraordinarily traditional and hierarchical in the way it was run? I mean, again, I'd been there 30 years, and as a president of the European business, you were already part of the elite group, if you, if you want to call it that. Um, but you were not ever, or at least uh, as far as I understand it, you were not based in Japan no, until you took the top job. No, but I'd been going there for 30 years many, many times a year, sometimes for you know, several weeks at a time. Um, but I, I knew Olympus was you know, ripe to be um, developed, and it could become a, a world healthcare company to compete with the J&Js and the Covidians of this world. It, Japan could dominate healthcare because of its platform in flexible endoscopy. Um, the company was though sleepily managed, like many Japanese organizations, it, it wasn't very good at closing loss-making businesses, so capital was invested in the wrong place. Uh, the Japanese, and this is a generalization, but the Japanese are very poor, in my opinion, at assessing the strengths of Westerners. Um, I've seen many times people, excuse my language, but literally bullshitting and the Japanese taking it. So the company had around the world a lot of mediocre or worse non-Japanese management. Mm. Uh, and in Japan itself, the age hierarchy meant that there, were, there was great strength in the middle management, but young people weren't promoted who were much smarter than their bosses, often into, not until their 50s. So by making some changes overseas, not many, but changing some of the people overseas and allowing the talent in the middle of the company in Japan to be liberated, you could do so much on the bottom line because the company overall was so modestly profitable despite this super high margin business. Okay, so uh, that's great. So we've got a sense of what Michael brought to the table when he got the top job. What we're going to talk about for the next uh, 40 minutes or so 
is how it all unraveled. And it unraveled because of a, a word or a phrase that we use in English, uh, which is simple to say, not so simple to do, and that is whistleblowing. Um, and I'm going to, of course, the title of our talk is Whistleblowing Proof of Courage or Betrayal. And I'm just going to bring up now onto the screen uh, the voting question that we're going to put to you, and you can ponder as we talk. I'm sure all of you know roughly what whistleblowing means. It essentially is the decision taken by somebody inside an institution, be it a corporation or a government, to reveal a hidden truth, something that is wrong. Often it's illegal activity, uh, something which they feel the institution they are working for is covering up, and they make a decision to expose it. Is it, that is whistleblowing, a threat to public safety? Can it be viewed in a negative light? Well, you lot <laughs> have already spoken on that. I, oh, I am amazed that 7% of you, 6% of you, think that possibly whistleblowing can be negative, a threat to public safety, but it's, it's, it's going higher. Let's, we'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> the, the more I tell you what to think, the more you're going the other way. Um, Michael. Let, let's, before, before it, we... it was certainly a threat to my safety. <laughs> well, we're, we're going to talk about that. Before I, I uh, haul you lightly over the coals, I do mm. want you to explain what you did and how it transpired. Because mm. I think it's important to be clear, when you took the top job, it, it wasn't you that initially revealed what was a massive and long-term sort of... Um, fraudulent exercise yeah. that had been engaged in by the, the directors of, of Olympus, it came out because of media reporting, but then you decided I, to I mean, act on it. I mean, the real whistleblower in this case is uh, an executive with Olympus who is still with Olympus, who went to a small magazine called Factor mm. and gave them the information and Factor published. That's how I found out. So the, the frightening thing was it was not picked up by any mainline media in Japan. None. That's what was so extraordinary. But here's the first moral question then for you, ethical question. If you had not been put in this extraordinarily difficult position, the new chief, the new president of the company, only to find as soon as you're appointed that a Japanese magazine, albeit an obscure one, mm. is printing articles suggesting that merger and acquisitions activity of the company has been driven by corruption and fraud for years, mm. if you hadn't been put in that position, would you have... Cared. I mean, w w you were forced into taking a stand. It wasn't that you actually showed the courage to take this on yeah. and of itself because you were determined to change the company. In 2005 and 2008, I reported wrongdoing twice, including in relation to my predecessor as the president of Olympus Europe, to the German authorities who, in March 2011, initiated charges. So I had form in the sense of being very black and white if something was wrong. Uh, I would report it. Did it ever cross your mind to try and do a damage limitation exercise on this magazine's reporting rather than demand a deep investigation inside the company? No, not at all. I mean, uh, I mean it, when I say obscure, when I found out what it was, it had a, a subscription of 30,000 copies. You could buy it on the newsstands in Shinjuku. It wasn't like some obscure website, but if it had been on an obscure website, I'd feel just the same. Um, it was detailed, it was substantiated. Uh, a friend of mine who is a director of one of Japan's largest companies, I, I use a pseudonym in, in my book, Goro, you know, translated it for me. And it was, you know, it seemed, you know, when, the, when you have libel and slander laws in Japan as we do here, um, that there were questions to be asked. And I asked them with, within two days of getting back to Japan of the president and of the vice president. And when I saw their evasive behavior, their discomfiture, I knew at that moment there was something horribly wrong at the top of the corporation of which I was the president. So I, I was always very black and white about it. Yeah, uh, and to be clear, because it's a, an amazing story, you've likened it to a John Grisham novel, and it does unfold over weeks and weeks of a very fraught uh, interaction between you and, and the CEO, as because it's com complicated. He was you, you were the president. Yeah. He was the CEO, and then he made you CEO. And then soon after he'd made you CEO, they fired you. Mm. But basically, this guy was Mr. Olympus, 
until he appointed you. And then he obviously regretted appointing you and got rid of you. Mm. But, but, but the, 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 point, the point is, what was at stake was, was a series of, of acquisitions worth billions of dollars, mm. which apparently made no sense to anybody who understood Olympus's business, and also included weird add-ons adding up to hundreds of millions of dollars, which appeared to be completely and utterly unjustifiable in any business sense at all. First question for you is, you'd spent 30 years mm. inside Olympus in very senior positions latterly. Mm -hmm. You must, must surely have been aware of some of these acquisitions, so why didn't you blow the whistle earlier? I wasn't on the board until I became the president. I didn't join the Tokyo board. But, but two of the... But hang two on, of, well, one of them... Well, no, hang world, on, hang on. One of them... Uh, one of these He was so companies. nice to Christine yesterday, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> this is the real hard talk, yeah. okay? <laughs> Well, what can I say? <laughs> You're charming, she's charming, but uh, no. <laughs> the point is, sticking to the facts, one of the companies that was at the center of these absurd mer merger and acquisition, acquisition activities was a British company that you knew well, and you surely knew that it was not anywhere near worth the money that Olympus had paid for it. Did you never ask any questions? No, I, I, again, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but just to keep the facts very simple for the audience, there was two elements to this fraud. First of all, the acquisition of three, as I called them, Mickey Mouse companies in Japan, a mail-order face cream company, a plastic plates company for microwaves, and a recycling company, almost no turnover, and a yes. billion dollars. The second element was that Olympus had bought a British company, Jarus Group Healthcare, which you've just mentioned, in 2008. And when that was announced, um, I, I did have attention at the time because internally I was opposed to the acquisition, but when it was announced, it was applauded. It wasn't secret, it was applauded that Olympus were going to move further into healthcare. The company did pay a big premium. Uh, they did, 40%, uh, I believe. The EBIT over the market price. Yeah. That's not unusual in M&A activity in the healthcare sector. What was unusual... It didn't ring alarm bells in your... No, not a, no I thought it was a, a bit of a vanity purchase on behalf of Kikukawa, but there was, I didn't think it was illegal in any way. And the analysts thought that was a good thing for Olympus, that it was moving away from consumer electronics into healthcare. The fraud was that two years later, the company paid $700 million in fees to the Cayman Islands to an unknown uh, management consultancy. That amount of money was the largest payment in fees for M&A activity in the history of capitalism. Thomson Reuters spelt out that the nearest thing which came to it was when RBS bought AB and AMRO for 200, and they paid $232 million in fees. So three times the record. For what? A one piece of, one piece of paper saying yes. Olympus should buy Jarrah. Uh, uh, that, that was what I, I focused on and knew nothing about. You, uh, right. you knew nothing about that extra $700 million no. payment. Okay. No. So, so as far as you're concerned, a flag hadn't been waved no. before. So we get to this point in 2011, when you've got your feet under the table, you are the top guy, you're in Japan, which you've never been in before, and now you have this massive dilemma, because the magazines running these stories, more and more is coming out about just how wrong so much of this stuff seems to be. At what point did you realize that this was going to be, within the boardroom, a battle to the death? Either you were going to have to get rid of the guys who'd sanctioned these deals, the crooks, frankly, or they were going to have to get rid of you. At what point did it become clear to you that was the way it was going to go? I mean, after returning to Japan on the second day, coming back to Japan, because I thought when I arrived from Hamburg, where I'd been before, uh, this would be a huge issue within the company. But it wasn't mentioned. It was normality itself. Uh, I couldn't leave it any longer uh, and challenge the, the, the chairman. Um, and the vice president. And again, it was so evident when I said, you know, what were these three companies? Why did we buy these three companies? What are we going into the face cream business for? How did we value them? The answers were so ludicrous. Um, it, I knew then it was wrong. What I thought at that moment of time, that I thought the non-executive directors and my other board colleagues would be supportive of what I was asking for, which was something very simple, that we bring in forensic accountants and get to the, the truth, the facts. To be blunt about it then, mm -hmm. Much as I suspect many people in this room, uh, and the vote still suggests this is true, will be admiring of your whistleblowing and your determination to root out the cancer inside the company. But? But. <laughs> you, how did you know there was a but? But. 
There always is with you, Stephen. You, <laughs> you got it wrong. You got wrong the calculation about how it would pan out inside that boardroom and with the share, main shareholders. But, but I, wasn't, I wasn't making a calculation. I was simply, $2 billion, it was a fraud. I wouldn't have thought 14 other directors would deny the evidence which was assembled, including a report from PricewaterhouseCoopers, which I'd commissioned, one of the largest four, saying what Olympus had done was tr transgressing all sorts of things, including money laundering and all sorts of other things. I couldn't believe that 14 directors, intelligent men gone to the best universities in Japan, would not acquiesce to the request that we bring in forensic accountants. The, the, the way the cohesive, blind loyalty mm. to Kikukawa, and it's, it still makes me uncomfortable to think about the way they were. I knew them. I'd sat with them like we are sitting, meeting after meeting, year after year. I mean, you knew Kikukawa so well that he invited you to call him Tom, to give him a sort of anglicized name, because mm. you didn't speak Japanese, but you clearly felt a real bond with this guy. I, he was very paternal to me. You know, he, he, was, he was the guy who promoted me. I thought he was uh, um, somewhat fatherly, charming. Um, I, it wasn't until I was in Japan that I saw the total obedience. No one would ever question him. I mean, I would love to see him on Hard Talk. My God, it would have been entertaining. Um, <laughs> but he, he just, you know, he just lived for 10 years without questioning. And that's one of the problems of Japan. People don't question their superiors. See, what I find, uh, you, we, there's so many ways we can tease out what happened to you because it's yeah. so interesting. But one of the things that it seems to me we have to address is the degree to which it could ever have been possible for you to successfully run Olympus. I mean, you were a star performer in their European operations. They decided that you were going to be made president and run the company, but you didn't speak Japanese. You'd never lived in Japan. You knew something about Japanese culture, but you, ne you weren't steeped in it, and without the language, you never could be. In retrospect, do you think it, it was impossible, this task that you'd taken on? No, no, not at all. I mean, Carlos Goen didn't speak Japanese. I mean, the, people try and look for some nuance around this, some, some hidden something in there. But it was a $2 billion fraud. The Supreme Court judge, Kainaka, who investigated the Olympus scandal, described the Olympus board as rotten to the core and a board of yes-men, demonstrating the worst part of corporate life. You know, it's about a fraud and they didn't want it out, and I did. But it's about a very yeah. Japanese style of fraud, is it not? <laughs> what do you mean a Japanese style well, of fraud? <laughs> it was a if you look at what they did and how they covered it up, it says a lot about the way Japanese boardrooms and executives handle business. You know, there was an awful lot of mutual back-scratching going on, which meant people kept very quiet. Uh, Japanese companies, as I understand it, often invest in other companies as part of their baseline operations. It was not out of the ordinary that they would do these sorts of acquisitions inside Japan. You know, there was something about the way this worked that actually probably wasn't that surprising to many Japanese. Tabashi uh, uh, was, was relatively common in J Japan. It means to make it go away, to get it off the balance sheet. Um, but the Japanese government made it illegal. And what shocked so many people that it could go on for two decades, you know, losses going back to 1980 through the hands of three presidents, through the firm of two of the world's largest auditors. And if Japan is to be attractive, then people have to believe that the accounts are credible, a true and accurate reflection of the company they, they support. So... Um, I think a lot of people would be troubled if you think, well, this is a Japanese thing, it's okay. It, it can't be okay. The, the company's accounts were misrepresentation of $2 billion, no, overvaluing uh, the company. Granted, that's clear, and that, that shines through everything you did, that conviction that this was just plain wrong. Um, but getting back to the mindset of a whistleblower, uh. how much of a burden was it on you that as you continued this fight, and Kikukawa, the, the, the main man on the board who, in the end, you know, you were fighting with and he engineered your dismissal. Um, how much of a burden on you as this fight got worse and worse and frankly Olympus's reputation was being more and more damaged, yeah. you knew that tens of thousands of workers possibly were threatened with the loss of their jobs. If this company, as was quite possible, was so dragged down by this that it couldn't escape from under the, 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 the damage to its reputation, um, you could have, with your whistleblowing, 
have destroyed the company. No, you, you would never have destroyed, destroyed the company as such. It might have been reborn, but you know, it supplies 70% of the world's healthcare. It's a fantastic business. And whatever the end game would have been, those employees, those R&D engineers, those manufacturing, so many companies outside of Japan and within Japan would have loved to, to take over Olympus. So the actual entity itself would have gone on. Its healthcare business would have gone on. Um, but again, I, I think you have to keep a, a black and white orientation on this. Um, that what was weakening the company? I mean, we did have a face cream company. We did have a plastics plate company. And it was costing tens of millions of dollars a year to fund these things. Mm. It was just a huge and massive distraction which was sapping resources and energy from the organization. So the, the, the service I did to Olympus was, one, appoint strong management outside of Japan and several key appointments within Japan and bring to an end this horrible waste of energy and resource. So you were convinced that in the end it could only be for the long-term good of the company to continue with your fight. What about your own personal long-term good? Because, you know, this was enormously stressful for you. Mm. There were, as the FACTA investigation continued, there was the exposure of, of complicated links to what they called antisocial enterprise, I think, or organizations which are... Social forces. Yeah, essentially meant the Yakuza, the oh. sort of Japanese organized criminal syndicates. Um, again, never mind corporate, but personal, how much uh, of a burden was this? And at what point did you think, <laughs> I may have bitten off more than I can chew here? Um. I, I think the person it was hardest for was my wife. Um, the, the day I... Um, went to see the serious fraud office. But the first working day back in London, um, I expressed concern about my safety. I, I went to Scotland Yard and suddenly found out, as a member of the public, you can't go to Scotland Yard. They sent me to Belgravia Police Station. Uh, I walked in uh, to Belgravia Police Station, officers behind Perspex bullet screens, and said, my name is Michael Woodford, and I think I'm going to be killed by the Yakuza. <laughs> and they obviously thought I was a complete fruitcake. They thought and, you'd, been, uh, <laughs> you'd been on the sake or something. Yeah. yeah you'd... And he, I said, go w uh, ahead and Google. But hang on, why, why did you think, I mean, you know, I can see you're under great stress, mm. but why did you think your personal safety was at risk? And Facta had published that these transactions were linked to antisocial forces in Japan, $2 billion. You know, people have been killed for a lot less. But had you they had any, published it. The New you, York Times subsequently published similar allegations. Had you been threatened? No one had come up to me um, with a samurai sword or something and said, Michael, you know, we're going to chop your head off. Um, but, you know, the way they acted, the way that board reacted was so atypical for Japan. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned I was one of the few foreign presidents. I was actually the first salary man. That's the person who spends his life with the company. And mm. because of that factor, in Japan, I was well known. I was always on the telly and in papers and magazines. And they knew I would go public, but they were scared of something much more than that. And Factor had put this on the agenda. If you know anything about crime in Japan, you know, organized crime is pervasive. Mm. In October of last year, the Minister of Justice had to resign from the Noda uh, government uh, because of alleged links with the Yakuza. And that's the man in charge of the judicial system and the police force in Japan. Mm. So, you know, I'm not being emotive or exaggerated. I was scared. Um, a, few day, a few days back when I, uh, you're, you're asking the effect, those officers within a few hours escalated it and I had diplomatic protection and officers with machine guns and coming to my apartment in London, my wife is there and they're telling her you can't have a letterbox, people can put things through that. And to watch your wife, she's a Spanish school teacher, a middle-class girl, crumbling under the pressure, it, 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 it wasn't nice. No. The I... next day, the very next day, uh, Jake Alderstein, um, an American journalist who was the first foreign language uh, foreigner to write in Japanese for the Yomuri Shimbun, as a crime correspondent, a world authority on the Yakuza, writes to me and tells me my life is in danger. American journalists, uh, uh, Japanese journalists working for American journals, again told me my life was in danger. And I think it was. I still think it was. So what we have, and I, I, I totally understand the, the degree of, of, of concern you had, particularly with the Yakuza links, but what we had then was a... And this is all in a pretty dense period of time, because we're talking about a period from essentially October uh, 2011 through to the new year, the mm -hmm. beginning of 2012, where you had to... 
you'd been fired and you had to make some decisions then about what your next move was. I was still a director of the company, one of the quirks of Japanese company law. They stripped me of my presidency, CEO status and representative director status, but I remained a director and I went back to Japan in November um, and was met by 20 TV crews and 100 journalists and went back to the board meeting the night before the board meeting, the chairman, Kikukawa, the vice president, they resigned. They wouldn't face me. But I had to be manhandled into the Olympus headquarters. So, you know, I still had the right to attend the board meeting. I was still a director of the company. Right. But um, as I understand it, you decided that the only option you had would be to try to lead a move to get the entire board removed and to create, I suppose you could call it an alternate board, a new board, which would be right behind you, about, uh, right behind the crusade to clean up the company mm. and to build a new Olympus. That's right. I mean, those you, four... Wait, hang on, I'm finished the oh. question. <laughs> <laughs> Why did that fail? It failed because the Japanese institutional shareholders would not break ranks. The stock price, a month after I had been fired, had fallen 81.5%. Seven billion US dollars had been struck off the value of the company. Which, may I say, is partly why I said, did you never consider that you might be destroying your own you company? Wouldn't, you wouldn't destroy the intrinsic worth of the company, you know. Again, I don't know what compromise you would ask me, you know, hide it because it might be some bad PR. That, that would have been completely the wrong road. And the company would have always survived. If we were a, a, a commodity business making widgets, it mightn't have. But um, returning to, because mm. it's one of the fundamental differences. There's two, it, two big differences. Japanese media is self-censoring. There's no hard talk in Japan, by the way. So, um, so on Japanese state tele, well, uh, NHK. Yeah. On NHK, if I switch on the nightly news, the night you've been fired from the presidency, from the top job in the company, mm. did they report it? How did they report it? They acted like the, the media in general, Japanese media, acted like the press office of Olympus, despite it being in the, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, utterly bizarre. But the, their real crime was not reporting the fact article. Mm. That was the, the mm. real crime. It was a Japanese story, a Japanese... And why uh, is that? Is it just because there is a sort of uh, establishment uh, sort of mentality in Japan which says that you don't criticize very senior figures at the top of corporate life, you don't wash your dirty linen in public, or, or was there something uh, less sort of um, broad brush than that, something more specific to Olympus and its ties to... Uh, advertising revenues or something. Is that it? I mean, no, what, I, I, I'm interested I, to know because this know. Is, you know, we're going to get to your analysis of what this whole story tells us about Japan. I, some people criticize me for going to, to a Western newspaper, Jonathan Sobel, the Financial Times correspondent in Japan. I was at a, a party in January of 2012 with Jonathan and with one of Japan's leading financial journalists, an incredibly distinguished gentleman, works for one of the two largest selling newspapers in the world. And we were talking, and this was in front of Jonathan, and I said, what would have happened if I'd come to you and not Jonathan Sobel? And he said, I would have loved the story, Michael, but there wouldn't have been a hope in hell to quote his exact words. My editor would never allow it. You do not attack Nikkei-listed companies. You just don't do it. Full stop. And he couldn't see your argument that far from attacking the company, you were trying to save the company. He personally um, has great worries about Japan and the way its media functions. Um, but he's just been realistic. You, you don't do that. You just don't do it. I'm very aware that, and I can see from the live stream, that there's some great comments and questions coming up, and I want to open it up to the floor very quickly. But I think it's my duty then just to bring this story up to date. You know, you, in the end, abandoned your attempt to change the board. We're back to the, the same point. So there's media. The other issue is the Japanese institutional shareholders. Yeah. Um, if you, they have fiduciary duties. Shareholders have fiduciary duties themselves. Despite this collapse in the share price, despite what the Japanese Supreme, retired Supreme Court judge said, they would not utter one word of criticism against the incumbent board. Not one word. You mean because the, other, the main shareholders in the company were other corporate entities and key institutions which... Yeah. actually felt I mean, I, they were part of the same yeah. system as Olympus. I, you know, I, I could be a lawyer. The three lawyers looked at my book before I published. But I, I, SNBC, UFJ, Bank of Tokyo, Mizuo, Nisei, not one of these shareholders would say anything wrong. Never say anything. 
in criticism of the board. Not one word of support of me, who was still a director of the company, going through purgatory. That could only happen in Japan. And that perverted golf club mentality of a lot of what corporate Japan is, is so harmful and damaging. But that is a unique factor of Japan. It couldn't happen here. So thanks to the live stream, my next question is, so what happened to the crooks? Was there no criminal investigation? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I don't really need to do any more work. I just read the stream. So what happened to the crooks, and was there no criminal investigation? An interview by AutoQ, which is <laughs> not what I expected. No, the Japanese authorities, the, 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 the pressure of the world media, if I did anything, it was to bring this huge light onto it, became overwhelming. Prime Minister Noda spoke out and said, you know, please understand, Olympus is, you know, an exception. Japan works to the same rules as capitalism as elsewhere. It doesn't. You couldn't have institutional shareholders in acting sure. that way. Um, but eventually, in December, on December the 20th, uh, Olympus's headquarters, and this was well trailed, weeks ahead, I was, you know, where will you be because of your, your comments, raided Olympus's headquarters. I mean, talk about the lack of surprise. Yeah. And subsequently, three directors were arrested and indicted, including the, the chairman, Kikukawa. Said Mr. Kikukawa. Mr. Mori. And in September last year, in a Tokyo courtroom, they admitted their guilt, and last week, uh, the final defense pleadings were made. The prosecution have asked for five years in jail for Mr. Kikukawa, and he will be sentenced in July. Wow. And I mean, the rest of the board are being sued to hell and back by a, a multiple list of... Uh, so the very parties. same shareholders who didn't want to take them on are now suing them? No, not the Japanese shareholders. They're not. They're not part of those legal actions. G generally, the legal actions are from elsewhere. There is some in Japan. Yeah. But not from those shareholders. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I think you'd agree, it is one heck of a story. I mean, uh, an incredible story. And this St. Gallen 43, you know, has a theme of courage. And there is no doubt, I think, I mean, there's a huge amount of courage involved in, in what you did. But... Um, Stubbornness, maybe. It's better, just stubborn and, and pig-headed and bloody-minded about well, it. Well, it, it's interesting, big-headed. I mean, did you, do you think there was uh, an element of ego in some of what you did? Um, I was so petrified, um, you know, I mean, the, 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 you could say there's a degree of ego in it now, but, you know, frankly, after living with Mr. Kikukawa for that period, I've seen what vanity and ego does to people. And, um, you know, ego, you know, now you're, you're businessman of the year in all these newspapers, you get accolades and awards, but, you know, if I'm honest, it doesn't mean that much. You know, when you think you're going to be killed, when you see your friends from your, your colleagues, mm. you know, distance away from you. It's a, it is a disturbing, haunting thing. And, uh, you know, the superficiality of all that uh, accolade stuff, that doesn't mean much to me at all. Is there any way, when you look at back at this momentous 18 months or whatever it's been since, mm. um, is there any way you can look at it and think, if I'd handled it just a little bit differently, I could have both told the truth, tackled this cancer in the company, and stayed with the company? Or was that, in your view, even as you look back at it today, always gonna be impossible? I mean, a lot of people ask that question, but I wrote six letters. I begged, I pleaded to my board colleagues, you know, I, and they fired me. And I don't know what other way I could have done it. Sometimes colleagues who still work for Olympus say, Michael did the right thing, but he could have done it in a different way, but they've never explained to me how I could have done it in a different way. I tried internally, I tried with the company's auditors, I copied them from letters number four, and, uh, you know, 14 di directors felt they believed Mr. Kikukawa and not me. Some great questions. Mm. <laughs> Will you get another job? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of In people... In a corporation. A lot of people think, and I think the, the whole... Pretext of, I think a lot of people are cynical of, of, of captains of industries, not just in the financial yeah. community. I mean, it's interesting talking to some of the young people here about Switzerland, which is perceived externally as this rich country run by the banks and the large multinational Swiss corporations. But it was Switzerland which legislated through a referendum that company directors' salaries have to be approved by the shareholders, which is such a basic common sense thing. So, uh, you know, I think the days of whistleblowing that we are some type of leper colony, I think it, it, it has changed. I've been offered jobs of heads of company in Japan and in the... In the last year. Since this, yes. Yeah. Uh, and in the UK. You know, again, you're, you're back to the way we live our lives. 
After the intensity of it all, you know, I couldn't sit in a, a, a meeting room watching 200 PowerPoint slides. You know, something's changed. You know, that, 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 I just couldn't do it anymore. And, and, a, and a final thought uh, about Japan. You know, yeah. even in this conversation, you have said some very damning things about yeah. the way Japan's corporate culture works, about the link, you know, the, the lack of a truly sort of independent-minded media, about frankly, the failings, deep failings within the political system. Um, you seem to be saying, and there's, a, I think, a, a, a chapter in your book which simply is titled, A Rising Sun Also Sets. Yeah. You seem to be saying that Japan is, and I'm trying to think of a polite rather than a very rude word, um, in a very big hole. Yeah. I think it is. I mean, your interview yesterday with Christine Lagarde, where you talked about the Japanese policy now of loosening monetary policy. I mean, it's, not, it's, it's letting everything out. Um, what Japan needs is, is structural reform. Many Japanese companies uh, are zombie companies. You know, you read about this in all the financial media. They're supported by the attitude of the Japanese government and not wanting failure, and the Japanese banks lend to companies which would never match the risk criteria of, of Western financial institutions. That means that a lot of Japanese companies are run by board of directors who are mediocre or worse. There's no hostile takeover in Japan. One of the things which makes capitalism work is the weak get taken over by the strong. It doesn't happen in Japan. If you look at consumer electronics, Sony, Panasonic, Sharp, all those three companies which did so well in the, in the 70s and 80s, they're their debt is junk status. Mm. And it's nothing about fraud, it's about the attitude in Japan of allowing you know, the weak to be culled. And, and for meritocracy and able young people, be it women or young, there's, there's something terribly wrong. We have uh, one of the faculty is uh, the, the Japanese professor, professor who reported on uh, the Fukushima Commission. And he said the, pro the, the problem with Fukushima, it was, a, it was a problem made in Japan. And it happened because of the obsessive obedience, respect of elders without questioning, hierarchy, and you could take that template and put it onto corporate Japan. So we, we have the Abbey economics renaissance, but under, fundamentally there is no structural reform going on in Japan. It's got the highest life expectancy, the lowest birth rate, a population falling 800,000 a year, a GDP debt, to a sovereign debt of 250%. It's in a I feel like screaming and I'm not even Japanese. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I, I wonder if there are Japanese people in, in our audience who want to ask questions. Uh, I think time is, is ripe for me to shut up for a bit and allow you guys to ask whatever questions you've got. It is. An extraordinary story in so many different ways, and here's your opportunity to explore the notion of, of what whistleblowing is all about, whether indeed it's, it's a, a set of a, a moral and ethical decision that is always the right thing to do. Talk about Japan as well. Whatever you want to ask, Michael's here to take your questions. So uh, we'll start right at the front and we'll work our way back. Um, you, sir, if you just tell us your name and be brief, because I want to get as many questions in as possible. So keep it brief. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Yuya Ueda from Japan. <laughs> 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 um, uh, my question is that this, this case is re really just only for u unique case for only on, in Olympus, or it, it will be... Um, or uh, is it a the problem for Japanese yeah. legal system? Yeah. Or if so, what, what do you think? Uh, what, how le Japanese le legal system should change? Yeah, as you stand up and you are Japanese, as people who know me know, um, you know, I'm a great lover of Japan. I went to Noda for my holiday in October. I'm treated with incredible courtesy when I go back to Japan, and the women and men on the street, you know, come up to me all the time. So I am a hugely respectful and liking of the Japanese people. Um, there's a small part of Japan which all a tremendous influence, which is corporate Japan. And sadly, to answer your question, I think there'll be a lot of Olympuses out there. I mean, it was just luck and my ability as a Westerner to bring the world's attention to this particular case. You know, it, it, it could have been buried so easily, this case, could, this story could have been buried. So, sadly, I think there are a lot of Olympuses in Japan. Mm. Let's go over here. 
Uh, I, you two will have to fight each other to decide who's <laughs> going to ask the question. You, um, <laughs> go on. Well, keep it, keep it brief. To do it together. Well, maybe you could answer this question after you're done talking about Japan, because it's maybe a more general question. Uh -huh. But you seem to have uh, incredible moral fiber um, and belief in what you did. And I'm wondering, if we move away from um, financial whistleblowing that you've done with regard to fraud, how do you see the responsibility of directors in companies towards other impacts that their, their operations have, such as human rights along their supply chains, how their suppliers, workers are treated, like the case in Bangladesh most recently, mm. but yeah. thousands of other cases, and environmental impact and all these other things. Do you see a connection? And can directors take decisive steps, as you have done in this case, with regards to those issues? Yeah, yeah it's, Thank a, you. it's a very good, it uh, good question. Good question. Um, let me just again answer that in, in, in two parts. You know, the, the people who offered me most support um, were Japanese people. Colleagues in Japan were prepared to stand up on this new board, risk everything. Um, literally would have died for me. The person, the people who felt I betrayed me most weren't people who were involved in the fraud, but they were the senior managements in America, Germany, and the UK. Those people who had helped me expose the fraud the day I got fired, moved away in a way I would never have believed. I, I considered several of these people friends. You know, they'd been in my home, they'd held my ba children as babies. Yet, what it made me realize, and I, I, I can't help being a little bit jaundiced, and so it's not Japan, this is human nature. In Germany, America, and the UK, um, is that most people seem to care, from what I experienced, about themselves and their own nuclear families and to hell with everyone else. So it's not really a corporate issue, it's a societal issue. And um, boards of directors, since you know, Occupy Wall Street and all of these things and bankers' bonuses, I think what directors can do, it, much better than anything they can do when talking about corporate governance, is show moderation and restraint in what, in what they pay themselves. That would be an example. That would do something, and, and as I said, I think Switzerland have got that on the agenda in a very healthy way, because uh, cream may float to the top to the boardroom, but Deadwood does as well, and these people, uh, when they're talking about multiples of thousands of times of salary, it doesn't add up, it doesn't stack up. So if you want to demonstrate ethics, I think start with yourselves and show moderation in pay room, the pay in the boardroom. Uh, how, uh, how I wish... How I wish Michael Woodford had been in my workshop session with Larry Fink yesterday, who I think <laughs> last year pulled in 20-something million dollars as, as the CEO of the biggest fund manager in the world. Uh, it would have been a fascinating conversation for you to have with him. But uh, he, I don't think he's still here. If he is, put your hand up, Larry. We can have the... <laughs> anyway, listen, to, uh, I, I'm a really rubbish timekeeper, and we're running a little short of time. I'm going to take three at once. So there's a gentleman very patient right in the middle of the crowd. I'm going to keep it brief. I'm gonna, we're going to take three questions all at once. You, you go first, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm Daniel Walker, formerly with the Swiss Foreign Ministry, now with this university. Um, you spoke of Fukushima. Mm. May I ask a very unfair question? For the politically interested people in the Far East, the problem of Japan not atoning for the sins during the Second World War is probably the mother of all problems for future security structures and, and so forth and so on. Is this a particular Japanese problem? Uh, don't answer it yet. We'll just take three. Then we can uh, just keep them all in your head if you can. Uh, we'll take one at the back. The first gentleman you get to with the microphone at the back, whichever it's going to be. Sorry, but it's going to be that way. There we go. Hello, I'm Leonardo from Indonesia. I have two simple questions. The first one, it, was, it would be very easy for you to just shut up and probably resign. And you don't, won't have to create all the situation and go through all the risk that you've gone through. So why did you decide to whistleblow this? That's the first one. Second, what's the foundation of your action? There must be something. Not everyone in your position will do that. So what was the, the foundation of that? I think it will be very important for us, especially the leaders of tomorrow, the future leaders, to, to recognize uh, these kind of qualities and really bring that to the future. Thank you. Good, okay. And then uh, there was a lady at the front, very patient as well. We'll get her, then we'll do all three at once.
Hi, um, my name is Naho. I'm also from Japan. Um, I have a question. Um, as you are from outside of Japan, do you think it's possible for Japanese leaders who actually do the same thing? And also, is it, do you think it's possible for, uh, as part of the leaders of tomorrow, I want to know if it's, if it's possible to actually create that kind of structural reform from the bottom line, from the, the young people in, within the Japanese corporate culture? Okay. Uh, well, in, 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 in the order of the asking, yeah. I think the first question was about Japanese history and whether yeah. that... Yeah, I mean, I've traveled across Asia and I've, I've sensed the antipathy towards Japan and we've seen the, the scenes in China uh, in relation to the disputed islands in the East China Sea. My experience in Japan is it's overwhelmingly pacifist. You know, it, it is a country where, when I speak in private, people are honest and open. There are some extreme right-wing groups, but I, I don't think Japan is a warmongering country, and it is a democracy, and there is accountability. It may not be perfect, but uh, I have great sympathy, I must say, in the dispute between China and Japan. Japan, I think, has done everything it can to try and de-escalate that. But uh, clearly, compare it to Germany, it, it hasn't communicated itself well, and we know all of you know, what visiting the, the the, the, the graveyard and the cemeteries and all of those things, and it hasn't worked itself out um, of the system. But I think Japan is a p truly peace-loving country. All right. Well, thanks for that, Michael. So um, why not? Why did you not just shut up as other people in your position might have done, might have taken a payoff and just got the hell out? What was it inside you that just made you fight the fight you fought. Yeah, I mean, I, I get uncomfortable, you know, and, and feel irritatingly righteous. I'm getting irritating in myself, never mind uh, <laughs> anyone in the audience. I, I don't know, I, I think uh, I write in the book about my childhood when I stole money from my mother's purse, when I stole some che chewing gum from a, a supermarket, and the way my mother reacted, my parents were divorced. Um, and uh, I remember my mother saying to me, if, if you will steal from me, it was only for a bar of chocolate, uh, then who can I trust? Normally I would have got beaten. She was quite a, a strong-minded woman. And I, I think things lay down right and wrong. You can't cheat yourself. You can't cheat those who are close to you. So. But um, what, what surprised me is that people think it's unusual to react in that way. Mm. That's what surprises me. <laughs> Actually, a quick show of hands. That's a very good point. You. We have here a fantastic selection of two or three hundred leaders of today, tomorrow, and God knows when. I mean, you, you, you're all a very interesting test case for me. So let, who thinks that what Michael did was highly unusual and who, you know, therefore you suspect that most uh, corporate executives in his position wouldn't have blown the whistle? Who believes that? that he's, un he's actually very unusual as he sits up here today. And who believes that actually, you know, most execs at the top of a company like his probably would have done the same thing, given that it had gone out into the media in Japan at the time? Yeah, well, mo most people think you're pretty unusual. <laughs> um, uh, very quickly, because I'm being way too slow, uh, and you're going to have to be quick too. Can young people in Japan be the key to reforming so many of the sort of systemic problems you've talked about? You know, people use this expression, change in Japan can, can, can only come from outside influence. I don't believe that. I think Japan, like many societies, change has to come from within. It's incredibly educated. It's got a workforce, people. It's got a fantastic history and heritage. Uh, I don't know if it's just young people. You are going to have to, people of power and influence also have to go along with it. Uh, you know, societies sometimes throw leaders up. Britain, was, when I was young, was in a terrible state, literally anarchy, and, and Margaret Thatcher came about, and love her or hate her, she, she showed leadership. So um, I desperately hope, but it, it can, but it's not just the young, the people on the positions and the levers of power have to change. Okay, uh, I just want to, guys, if you're in the tech department, I just want to go to the second vote, because I'm enjoying voting, it's good fun. So we've got another vote for you, I think. If we can just bring it up on the screen, just before we finish, because I'm very mindful this session is actually about whistleblowing, um, the sort of morality and effectiveness of whistleblowing. And guys, if you're listening to me, there you go, well done. Whistleblow, let, we, we, we saw early on that most people, you know, clearly believe that whistleblowing is 
broadly speaking, um, a positive and the right thing to do. Um, so finally, ladies and gentlemen, vote on this. Whistleblowing is the most sensible way to reveal wrongdoing. Interesting. But it's not the most sensible way. The most sensible way well, is to do it from within. To, 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 whistleblowing is a last resort. Yeah. I don't know who's structuring these questions. Not but, me. You know, uh, I, am, I am a mere voice piece for the, for the great and good of St. Gallen who came up with these questions. But, but, you know, I think there are interesting things. I mean, put it this way. Mm. You are now known around the world as a whistleblower. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Amongst other things. Thank you. Uh, perhaps the only, the only guy who is more famous as a uh, quote-unquote whistleblower than you is, is Julian Assange. Mm. Um, do you like being in that company? I mean, do you think that there... <laughs> not, not in a hotel room in Sweden, but I mean... Yeah. In, the more, in the more generic sense, you know, do you think actually there can be good whistleblowing and perhaps less good whistleblowing, if you see what I mean. I mean, it's a simplification, and both cases are so totally different, of aren't course. they? Of um, course. I mean, I wasn't a whistleblower of sorts. That was a brave Japanese executive within Olympus, and that person's married partner to this day doesn't know they were, sorry, I don't want to give away gender, mm. they were the person who went to factor. That's yeah. the hero of this story. Yeah. And that, that poor person, what I did was say, why is the company not reacting yeah. to this media report? And, and no, so, you're right. You're right. Um, whistleblowing is, is a funny term. Truth teller, I prefer. I... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. I'm getting a reputation as being a terrible timekeeper, and that's such a lovely thought to end with, that this, in the end, is about truth-telling. And there cannot be a culture, an institution, a corporation where truth-telling should not be of paramount importance. So I, I think let's stick with that phrase, truth-telling. Let's link it to the theme of courage that St. Gallen's running with this year. And let's, at this point, first of all, thank you all for a, another great, really stimulating session with great questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get more of them in. But most of all, of course, to thank Michael Woodford for being with us today. Michael, thank you very thank much. Thank you for having indeed. me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.